Anyway, welcome to, uh, to talk. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Joel Bernstein. Um, I am a data engineer for LucidWorks and a Lucene Solar committer and PM PMC member. And today we're going to talk about visualization with streaming expressions and uh, math expressions and Fusion SQL. Um, before we get started, I'll introduce the technology a little bit because I'm not sure if everybody even knows what these terms are. But um, streaming expressions and math expressions are a functional programming language uh, that comes with solar. And um, its core use cases are data loading, searching, sampling, and aggregating data, transforming data, analyzing data, and modeling data, and visualizing data. Um, so these are like, um, you know, core kind of like data analysis type, um, you know, functions. And Fusion SQL is a commercial SQL front end to solar. And um, it's designed for many of the same use cases as streaming expressions. So fast request response use cases, um, exploratory data, data analysis, and also as a, a SQL data store for like um, applications as well. It supports ODBC and JDBC and stateless, um, an HTTP stateless interface as well. And the two visualization tools we're gonna look at today are Zeppelin Solar, which is a, an interpreter for Zeppelin, and Tableau. Okay, so this slide right here um, is interesting for, for two reasons. One, for the content of it, which we're not gonna talk about just yet, but for how that it was created. So this slide was created with um, using Zeppelin Solar. And so basically Solar did you know, kind of set up the visualization for it. So um, I'll show you how it works. Um, there is a function called zplot, which is a streaming expression, and its um, main use is to take vectors, basically arrays, and make them plottable by Zeppelin. So in the example we have up here, the function zplot has two variables, x and y, and they're set to um, two arrays. And one array has you know, the data prep and data analysis, and then the other one has the numbers for both of them. And you can kind of plot anything you want uh, using zplot like this inside of Zeppelin. And so what you see here is that I chose to use a, a uh, pie chart. And um, so I could have you know, chose to you know, any number of visualizations that Zeppelin has. But kind of the takeaway from this is that Zeppelin Solar with Solar is on its own a visualization engine unto itself. So you don't need other visualization tools for just plotting vectors. Or, and it does other types of visualizations, visualizations as well, but we probably, those are a little more advanced that will be, they're in the docs. And so this is the actual output of zplot as a table. And you can see that what it did is it took the two vectors and just turned it into basically rows in a table. And that is the, um, basically the format that Zeppelin needs to plot. And here's an example of plotting multiple uh, vectors. So we have an x-axis with an array, a y-axis with an array, and a y1 with an array, and we're gonna plot the, um, the x-axis and then both y-axis as different lines. And you can see that it's doing it on a line chart. And so, you know, you could choose any one you want, but you can see that, you know, it's easy to plot all kinds of, you know, as many vectors as you want in any different format that you want to do it in. And this just shows how you actually do a visualization once you um, uh, actually run it. So basically what happens is, is that um, you can see that this is, the, this is basically the settings for the line chart. And there's three available columns, X, Y1, and Y. And you just drag and drop them to the correct spot. And that just creates the visualization. So basically, you have you know, uh, you know, drag and drop visualizations using you know, Solar and Zeppelin. You don't have to you know, make things. It's, it's very easy to use. OK, so back to this slide. So now back to the content of this slide. And, you know, there's um, a saying in data science that 80% of the work is just prepping the data, and 20% of the work is data analysis. 
And in my own experience, that's, that's pretty true. You know, we spend a lot of time um, on data prep. And maybe with this next release of solar, we can do something to help with that. So in solar 8.3, we have a new feature called visual data loading. And I'll show you an example of it. And so this is a slide that shows um, a streaming expression, uh, the cat function, which works like the Unix cat command. And what it's doing is it's reading a file called iris.csv, which is sitting underneath of solar home. So it's taking a raw CSV file, comma separated file, and it's reading it directly. And then there's a function that wraps it called parse CSV, which is taking the output of the cat file and parsing into CSV fields. And then immediately it comes out as a table, which we're visualizing with Zeppelin Solar in Zeppelin. So you can see right away, you know, a couple things. If you don't know much about streaming expressions, this is how they work. You have a function, and then the output of that function feeds another function. In this case, we have two functions. And um, so what's, what's nice about this is that, you know, there are a lot of CSV files sitting around that you could be putting into solar, you could be analyzing. Um, it kind of opens up a world of data to you um, that you might have had trouble getting to before without writing more code. And we'll get into that a little bit more. But you can see that it's you know, this quick just to start visualizing data off disk. So this is what it looks like in table format. So at this point, rather than the visualization, we're actually seeing each, um, each row and the columns in it. And you can start to look at this data and understand it from a standpoint of how you might load it into solar. And in the next slide, we're going to map the fields that are coming from this to field types using dynamic fields. So there's a select function, which wraps the parse CSV function, and we're selecting the ID field. And then notice underneath it, we're, we're, we're doing the species field as species underscore S. And basically what we did there is we said, take the species field and you know, change the name of it to species underscore S. And what that did was use a solar dynamic field to ensure that you had the right field type. And this is quite important because if you didn't have this, you, know, you could make solar guess and it could be wrong. Or what ends up happening is, is that fields that you don't even want show up anyway because they're just in your data. So this allows you to select specific fields and then map them directly to the field types that you want without having to touch any configurations. So in many ways, this is almost kind of an ideal data loading you know, script tool. And you can see that um, in the actual table, you now see the field names have changed in the output table to have the actual the, the, the suffix for um, dynamic fields. And then we can index the data. And all we have to do to index the data is wrap an update function around it. And in this case, we're updating a collection called Iris, giving a batch size of 25. And then anything that comes out of that select statement, which is the fields that have been renamed, are just going to go to the Iris collection. And so they'll get indexed. And the output of this is, it says the batch, how many documents were in the batch, the total now that were, that were done, and which worker, and the batch number. And you could actually take the batch number and make it the x-axis, and the total index to make it the y-axis, and plot that as a visualization. So you can visualize you know, your data loads. OK, so let's look at some other things that we can do with this. We can do um, what I call visual grep. So instead of sending the data to be indexed, we're going to wrap it in a having function, which filters the data. And notice the having function has this matching clause at the bottom. So it's saying match the species underscore s field with anything that starts with, you know, so accept something that starts with ve. And we're taking, you know, we're basically filtering the output by a regular expression, and we're immediately visualizing it. So you can imagine having lots of data on disk that you want to filter and look at and grep, log files, anything. And this gives you a way to look at it and filter it before you load it, or maybe you don't even want to load it. Maybe all you want to do is visualize it and look at it. 
Okay, we can also transform the data on the way up, and we have all kinds of string transformations. I'm going to only show a couple of them. This one is the upper function, and notice that the, the species field has the upper function around it. So not only in this case are we remapping that field to species underscore s, but we're also uppercasing it. So there are all kinds of things you may want to do to clean the data before you put it in. So there are tons of like, you know, these string manipulation functions that we can use. And you can see in the table, you can see that it worked. You can see it's been uppercased. Here's the concat function. So it's often the case that you need to concatenate fields, um, maybe to create a new ID or you just you know, need to do it. In this case, I'm just taking it, you know, the ID field and the species field and concatenating it by the delimiter of a dash and making that the ID. And you can see that in the output. And this is the last one I'm going to show. Um, in many ways, it's the most interesting one, which is a transform that uses the analyze function. And what the analyze function does is it applies a Lucene Solar Analyzer to a text field as it's being run through this. And so you can see the analyze function here. And it's being applied to a field called resolution description. And the analyzer that it's going to use is the one that's attached to the underscore text underscore field, which is just a basic text analyzer. And the output of that is going to be basically a, an array of terms or an array of tokens from the analyzer that are, is going to be set to the field term underscore s. And so at that point, we have, you can think about how this might be used. You can devise analyzers that do very interesting things like entity extraction and things like that. And so you can offload a lot of the heavy work from your, in, from your basic your search nodes to do it in another node here and attach it and just index. Or an even more interesting use case is what I did here, which I have a function called Cartesian product. And what the Cartesian product does is it explodes a field that has a multi-value in it, and so that each one of those fields become their own documents. And so in this case, the Cartesian product function is working over the field called term underscore s, which is where the terms went. And you can see in the output here, there's a field called term s, which has all the terms, the like individual terms, in their own documents. So basically, we turned the, the output of an analyzer into a stream of data that we can then either index or analyze on the fly. So we can aggregate this using other functions. You know, we can index it into the index, and we can do graph traversal on it to understand how terms are related to each other. So it's a really interesting feature, and um, you know, I suspect there'll be some you know, interesting uh, things done with this. OK, so enough with uh, visual data loading. Let's get to um, searching, sampling, and aggregation. And this stuff is really, when you get down to like, uh, the heart of what doing visualization and statistical analysis is, it's really about getting to data, finding the right data set, selecting it, um, boiling it down to something that can be worked with, either with a sample, um, an aggregation, or a top end search. And then you know, moving from there. So let's, let's take a look at some examples of how to visualize things. So we have a function called search. And that function is now searching the same data that we just indexed. And you can see how simple this is. That's the other thing that I really want people to take away from this, is the simplicity of using this system. So you say search the iris collection, bring back 150 rows, and immediately we're visualizing that data. There are very few systems that kind of make this that easy, particularly at the kind of scale we could operate at here. In this case, we're operating at a very small scale, but we can operate at really large scales with this. Here's an example of a random sample taken from a solar collection. In this case, we have a function called random, which is taking a sample from the logs collection, and it's taking a query. So we have the Q parameter, which is saying, give me all the records. And we're bringing back two fields this time, not just one. So file size D and response D. And we're bringing back 500 rows. And the way that we've chosen to visualize this is in a scatter chart with the file size on the x-axis and the response time on the y-axis. And immediately, we have a random sample 
that we can see the relationship between these two fields. So very quick you know, analysis. When, before we did this, these two fields were kind of like a black box. We didn't know what they were. Now, not only do we know about their own kind of like distribution, uh, we know how they relate to each other. Um, and not only that, our random sample is done in a way that it can be, um, you can infer something about the larger data set from it. You could say, um, even though the sample's small, you, if you want to, you can run multiple samples. It runs, this runs in, you know, in, in sub-second time and see if it looks the same. Okay, so we're gonna look at aggregations now. Um, we're gonna look at four, facet, facet 2D, time series, and significant terms. Okay, so here's a facet aggregation, and this is working on the NYC311 data set, which is the complaint data set for New York City, the 311 line, which is actually one of the coolest data sets you can play around with it, um, and I'm just, you know, barely touching everything you can do with it. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to do a two-dimensional aggregation. Um, we're doing a query that says the status, uh, status of each of the record is pending. So show me all the records that have a status of pending. And then we have two dimensions in the buckets field, which is borough and complaint type. And then we're going to sort on the count star, and then we're going to bring back 20 rows, and we're going to count them. So basically what we're saying is, show me the top 20 combinations of boroughs and complaints with a status of pending. And you can see how nicely we can visualize that with a grouped bar chart. And you can just see right away, you know, these are the pending things that are most, you know, the most in different boroughs. And we have another aggregation called Facet 2D, which specializes in creating matrices. And it works a little different than a two-dimensional um, from the Facet function, in that Facet 2D is designed to, to guarantee how many of each, of each uh, X and Y you get. So I'll explain a little bit. So in this case, um, again, we're doing NYC311 data. We've got a query across all data. And then we have an X, which is going to be borough. And we have Y, which is complaint type. And then we have dimensions. And that dimension says, give me the top five boroughs and give me the top five complaints for each borough. And that's different than facet, which is said, give me the top 20 combinations, which doesn't guarantee that you'll have all the boroughs in it. And so um, when this comes back, what you get is a matrix here, which I'm displaying as a heat map with the, um, the boroughs shown as the columns and the, oh, actually the, borough, the, the rows are the, um, the boroughs and the columns are the different complaints. And this is a nice way to see kind of which, you know, what complaints the different boroughs have in common um, and you know, which ones are different. And a, a quick overview of this. Okay, so the next one we're gonna look at is called time series, which, um, you know, time series, time series is kind of one of the core kind of like data science activities is, you know, generating time series and analyzing time series. And in this case, I'm working with a different database, which is a database of stock returns, um, or daily stock returns for the past, I don't know, 20 some years. And um, I'm looking at, um, in this case, I'm using the ticker Amazon. And um, I have a start date and end date and a gap of one month. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm showing an aggregation of the average closing price for Amazon, you know, monthly from, from basically 2010 to 2018, basically. And so you can take that output. So the aggregation is very fast across very large data sets. And you can take that and show it as a line chart and immediately kind of understand, you know, Amazon's stock story over that time period. Okay, so the last thing we're going to look at is um, significant terms. And before we look at significant terms, I'm first going to show facet for one thing, and then we'll take a look at significant terms. So in this case, what I'm doing is we're aggregating using, you know, straight faceting, straight counts for show me basically the most common complaint types in Brooklyn. And you can see that the most common one is noise residential, and it's got a pretty high count. So what we know about this is that there's a lot of noise complaints in Brooklyn. What we don't know is if there's a lot of noise complaints in Manhattan, or if there's a lot of noise complaints in the Bronx. So we have no idea of knowing whether this is just, you know, something that's very common, or it actually matters to Brooklyn. 
So if I take the significant terms function and do this function, so I call significant terms, and same database, and I'm saying the query is Borough Brooklyn, give it the field complaint type, it's going to find me the most significant complaints for Brooklyn, and it's going to score them. And the one that comes up is elder abuse, which is, has nothing to do with the other ones, and um, it has, um, it explains why. So the reason why is that there's a foreground score of 285. So that means that there were 285 occurrences of elder abuse reported in Brooklyn, which is the query, and a background score of 298, which means that across all the other boroughs, there was only 298 total. So at that point, you realize that, oh, wow, of all the ones that occurred, you know, they really are occurring at a much higher rate in Brooklyn which gives you a really interesting piece of information. And you can apply this function in all kinds of different ways. So that you, know, you could look at, you can use this for anomaly detection, you know, in credit card data and things like that. And it, it's fast and it you know, cuts through a lot of uh, noise that, um, actually interesting. So it's funny, the noise, this one had noise residential as high up, and this one has noise house of worship. I just saw that. So it's, uh, that's much more, uh, common in Brooklyn. But it cuts through kind of like all of the, um, the things like the, the facet function gives you back very high counts, but those counts can represent noise in a way, rather than, um, rather than actually giving you information about what's important to Brooklyn. Okay, and here's how I visualize significant terms. So in this visualization, I've got the foreground score on the x-axis, the background score on the y-axis, and then the terms in a bubble. And the bubble is the score. So you can see that, that you know, the highest scoring one has the biggest bubble, but you get to see that just because it's the highest scoring one doesn't mean it had a particularly high foreground or background. And so it's really interesting as you do this on different data sets with different, um, you know, different you know, characteristics, where these bubbles end up, what they look like. You know, sometimes you'll find that you know, having a really high foreground and background score will be enough for it to be pushed to the highest score. It all depends on, you know, how the, um, how the math, you know, scores it. Okay, so that's, that's the kind of like um, the part about streaming expressions. We're going to talk now a little bit about Fusion SQL and math expressions. And so Fusion and SQL, um, like I mentioned, it's a commercial piece. Everything we've shown so far here is open source. Um, you can just you know bring down the project and use it. Uh, Fusion SQL is part of um, you know the commercial offering, and um, so basically it's a combination of Spark SQL, which provides a thrift server, um, a SQL planner, and a JDBC front end to it, and the Fusion SQL optimizer, which is the thing that we spend a lot of time with at at LucidWorks building, which is the ability to take a SQL query and optimize it to a Solar query and then solar cloud in the background for running, uh, running the queries. And so let's look at this example. So I'm going to, to again work with the stock data here. And um, in this case, I'm showing two tickers if we look at, the, uh, at exactly what the visualization is first. So we're looking at um, Amazon and Google together and what their, um, what their prices have done over time in an aggregation. And so you can see that's quite a, you know, um, you know, a nice clean visualization. And then if you look at the SQL query, you can see how cleanly you can write this type of thing. So you know, we've got the select, we're selecting a few fields, we give it the average, you know, the, the, um, the table it's coming from, and then you know, the tickers, some date ranges, a group by, order by, and this is like, you know, it seems so simple, but you know, it's so powerful because it made, you know, what would have been somewhat of a tricky or harder thing to do in solar before a, a simple thing to do. And this plugged into um, the, the standard JDBC piece of Zeppelin, but this query will plug into any JDBC compliance um, visualization tool and you can start using it. So what seems simple is actually quite a nice breakthrough for like being able to visualize aggregates, you know, work with data for solar. Okay, the next kind of um, 
piece of this is the ability to do math expressions over SQL results. And so I'll explain how math expressions work. So they work in kind of like, they have, they basically it's a three-step process. So you select the records with a SQL query. Um, you analyze the data with math expressions, and then you visualize the data with math expressions. So let's look at a math expression. So first, let's look at the visualization. So in this visualization, we just see, um, you can see that there's um, kind of like a line, a, a dark blue line, which um, is labeled Amazon. And that is the Amazon stock price. And then you see a light blue line, which is labeled fit. And what that is, is basically it's a, it's a fit of a nonlinear model through Amazon's time series. And um, you, know, you can see it's, you know, it's, it's clean, it's easy to read, you know, it's very understandable. And so let's see how we got there. And so what is above it is a math expression. And so this is um, basically a streaming expression that you know, just is called, there's, there's pieces of streaming expressions which call math expressions, they operate with variables typically. And in this case, um, I'll explain how it works. There's a function called let, which wraps everything, and let sets variables. So anything inside of let expression is for setting variables. The first variable, variable A, is set equal to a function called JDBC. And the first parameter of JDBC is just a SQL query. So basically, the output of that SQL query gets set to variable A. That SQL query is the time series query. So it's bringing back the time series data, but rather than just going straight to visualize it, we're putting it to a variable. And then the next line, we're taking um, a field from that output, um, which is, so you notice that the first, um, so first of all, the function is called call, and this is being set to, to variable x. And so basically, we're taking a column from the outputs of the, of the SQL query, and we're moving it to a vector, because we're going to do vector math. So math expressions is a matrix and vector math library. And so we're taking the column called year month s, which is basically the, the, the year and month from the SQL query. And we're moving it to the variable x, which is basically going to be uh, an array of months. And then the next one, we have a, a vector called y, which we're taking um, basically the column from the same output, a, and we're taking the average closing price column from it and putting that in variable y, which is going to be a vector of numbers representing the closing prices. So we have two variables, x and y, two vectors. Okay. Then we have our, our regression function called polyfit, which is doing polynomial regression, which is a nonlinear regression. Uh, and you can see how simple it is. We can do nonlinear regression. All we're doing is passing it the y variable, which is the vector of, um, of prices, and the value 2, which is the, the, the the degree of polynomial, which basically says how curvy should it be. And then what comes out of that is the model. It comes out basically a fitted model. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to plot this. And we plot, use zplot here. And so remember, zplot is going to take these vectors and turn them into a table. And so in this case, we take x and just plot it as x. We take the output uh, um, parameter Amazon and put, put y there. So that's basically Amazon's um, that's Amazon's time series data. And then we have an output parameter called fit, which is the model. And then zplot just plots the model. And so you can see that's it. So in that small line of code, we did a distributed aggregation. We vectorized it, we um, modeled it, and we plotted it in really what amounts to really, if you take away kind of like the, the SQL spacing, like four or five lines of code. And the last example just builds on that to do a forecast. And let's go to the visualization first. So the visualization um, basically shows you um, the Amazon time series, but it just drops to zero at one point. And that's where our data ends. But notice our model doesn't end. It just extrapolates it out. And you can see by looking at that extrapolation that indeed, if Amazon continued at that same curve, that's where they're going to be. So you could do all kinds of things to like, you know, try to determine whether or not the model is right, but nothing is better than looking at it. And you can look at that and say, yeah, you know, if it continues on that curve, that's where it's going. So it's very similar to what we just did. The only thing that we're going to do um, and to create it, this, the extrapolation or the, um, the forecast is we're just going to create 
Um, basically, after we do the fit, you can see the line poly fit y2. We're setting that to a, a variable called f. And then we're creating a new y vector where we're just appending zeros, 10 zeros, to the original y. That's where it drops off. It becomes nothing. And the next thing, we're going to create a new x-axis. And we're just going to create the x-axis -ax as a sequence. And the sequence is the length of the new, of the new y-axis. So basically, you know, 0 to, in this case, looks like 104 or something. And then we're going to predict using our fitted, um, the polyfit, which is the f variable. And we're going to predict it using the new x-axis, which is just the sequence. And what comes out of that is the extrapolated model. And you can see, and then we're going to plot it the way we did before. And so the simplicity of this um, you know, is that you, know, you can you know, quickly you know, aggregate and then fit and then extrapolate and visualize you know, with very little bit of code. And also, in some ways, very little knowledge of what any of this is actually doing. Like under the covers, you don't have to know what polynomial regression is doing or anything. The docs cover this really well. OK, so let's look at Tableau. The nice thing about um, Fusion SQL is that um, you're going to be able to get uh, direct access to a lot of um, visualization tools, even ones that are not you know, JDBC compliant. So Tableau is not really a JDBC tool. But Tableau, when you go to it, it actually has you know, a selection to just choose Spark. And because Spark is so well um, you know, integrated, we get that integration for free with this. So we go through, you click um, Spark, you're in Tableau. And so let's do a visualization in Tableau. So Tableau took a little bit of time for me to, to understand. But basically what it boils down to is it's a, a drag and drop pivot table. So you can take fields and just drag them into the rows and columns, add a filter, and then pick the visualizations, and you're done. So, um, so you get to the point where anybody can use it. And the advantage of using Fusion SQL with it is that Fusion SQL scales. So you can shard out, and you can do your aggregations across you know, hundreds of servers, and it will come back with results. The aggregates are going to be usable in Tableau. So let's look at what we're looking at here. So we're looking at that stock database. And this will give you an idea of what the stock database has in it. On the left-hand side, you have dimensions and you have measures. So dimensions are just categorical fields, and measures are numeric fields. And um, what I did to make this visualization is I dragged over um, the dimension year, month to the columns. I just dragged it over, dropped it in. And then I took the measure close D and dragged it over. And then I added a filter, I took a, um, a dimension ticker S, dragged it over the filter, typed in Amazon, and I was done. And then I started, I just chose my, my charts. And that's, that's how simple it is to use Tableau. And it came up in, you know, sub-seconds. And one more example, because, you know, Tableau is more than just, um, you know, line charts and bar charts. It can do scatter charts. It can do statistical analysis. Um, it's, a, it's a nice tool. So I'll show you, um, this is a, an analysis doing, um, doing a scatter plot. And so in this example, um, I dragged over, instead of um, a categorical field, I dragged over basically two measures, two, um, two numeric fields. So in this case, the volume field for the stock price, or for the, for the daily stock change. And then the change, which is the, the, uh, the change between the closing and the opening price. And so when I did that, it then plots it as a scatter chart, or I was able to plot it as a scatter chart. And what the scatter chart is showing you, and I'm, I have two filters. I have one saying I want for Google, and then for a period of several months, I'm doing this. What it shows you here is that um, as the volume rises, what does that do to the daily change in stock price? And you can see, first of all, by looking at this, that the volume is clustered around a certain set of numbers. And once it gets ahead of that, past it, the, the change, the dispersion starts to grow. So as the volume goes up, you have more volatility on those days. It's simple, you know, to, I mean, but it's interesting to visualize and understand how these things work, how they behave, you know, in the real world. So that's it. So that's it for the presentation. There's a, um, 
uh, the visual guide to streaming expressions and, man and, and math expressions is going to release in Solar 8.3 along with the visual data loading. And I'm going to wrap up so I can take questions. Any questions? So I ran it in its default mode, which I think was HTTP mode. And it just ran. So it's not like uh, Superset, which had other, right. other issues with it. I know it works on HTTP, uh, the Tableau, earlier versions of uh, Fusion as well. I, I was hoping that everything just converges to one mode so that you can install and run in one mode. Yeah, yeah. Superset, Tableau, everything could just run. Yeah, so there, uh, basically, the question is, you know, there's there's different modes that the Spark SQL engine can run in. And one engine that, that, that you can use to look at it is called Superset. And another one is Tableau. And they actually want other, they, they both want, they want different things. So the, the question was, can we get it to be kind of so that everything can use the same version? And I don't actually have the answer to that here, but it's certainly something that we want. We want to just set this up and run it and everybody uses it. So, um, so I think we can, you know, start to address that, you know, pretty quickly. Yep. So Tableau is only going to connect to Fusion SQL, so not to Solar at all. Okay, so you'd have to have Fusion SQL, you know, basically installed and running with Solar. So it's pretty, so I, there's, a, there's like an online um, a blog that describes how to do this, but basically when you use the Spark um, connector, it fills in a, a lot of it for you. You give it a username and password, and then there's a couple of, um, there's a couple of things that you do, like it, you, you, it's best to read, to read the, the, actually the blog on it, we probably should have official docs on it as well, but it, it, it's a few minor things you do to just click and you're in. So it's pretty seamless for getting into Tableau. Yeah. Hi, Joel. Uh, hey, Eric. We worked together off and on for years. The select statements that you have, both in, both in the SQL world and in the, uh, in the, the community expression, world, yeah. are pretty simple. Yeah. But those are, those, those are arbitrary solar queries, correct? OK, so let's talk first about, there were, there were two selects. There was a select SQL query, which is a different animal than the select in streaming expressions. So in streaming expressions, you know, that is a, a query, it's a function that's designed to, to basically manipulate and change fields from an underlying query. I, I, what I'm really after is the queries that you're firing and that are pulling the data out of the solar index. Yes. In this case, can be an arbitrary sweep, not simple solar query. Yes. Which gives you a lot more flexibility in terms of how you slice and dice the data than uh, what, what you do in the database. Yes, yes. So Fusion SQL, is going to be able to do things that other relational databases can't do. So we only have two minutes left. Is there any more questions? Yes, yes. So everything that I showed you up to the Fusion SQL slide is, really, is, is in Solar. Uh, these are newer versions of Solar. Um, and the Zeppelin Solar plugin is free. You can just you know, bring it down. The documentation is going to cover this really well. So um, my strategy going forward is to you know, get adoption through the best docs. So I'm going to work on having, you know, this is going to have great docs. It already has really good docs uh, as, as of Solar 8.3, but the docs are going to continue to improve to the point where you, know, you won't ever need a consultant to use it. And not only that, the docs teach, to, they teach to, uh, statistics as well. So you'll understand how to apply the statistical functions to the data and visualize them. There's a couple hundred visualizations in the docs now. All right. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you.